So this is the final Sunday of our Back to the Basics series where we're looking at Christian decision-making or discernment. Uh, and in the Wesleyan Methodist um, heritage, we have this thing called the quadrilateral, <laughs> which just sounds like school. But it's really, there's four areas in which we can, well, really three areas that help us interpret Scripture better, because Scripture is primary. That's how we interpret what's true, um, and we discern what God's will is for us. And we use this analogy of a table with three legs, with uh, Scripture, of course, being primary, and then uh, tradition and reason uh, and experience are ways we can interpret Scripture. And today's word is experience. We're going to hear more about what that means Particularly, what did John Wesley mean by experience and how we interpret Scripture and just discern what's true? Um, and, you know, when I was thinking about this message about experience, and this is such a distracted generation, and I'm, I'm with you. Like, I go through uh, stories on Instagram or Facebook, and like every five seconds, I'm like, bam, bam. You know, you see little videos, right? I mean, right now, you're probably thinking about something else. You're not even listening to me right now, right? You're probably not. You're like, especially if you're at home, you're definitely not listening to me. You're like, it's probably sitting in your underwear or something, you know? And that's totally fine, by the way. I'm glad these cameras don't go both ways, you know? But um, we're distracted people. And, you know, either you're looking at an image of yourself or you're looking at an image or a video that someone else made uh, and you're looking at them. And so we're a very distracted generation. And what's everybody's topic, favorite topic of conversation? Um, is themselves, right? I mean, really, I mean, like, if you're, let's say you're an introvert, and you want to strike up a conversation with someone, if you dare to, um, then ask them about themselves, and they will gladly tell you, right? Unless they're an introvert, then they just want you to go away. They don't even want to talk to you. Um, but typically, yeah, self, we like, yeah, I like to talk about myself. You want to talk about yourself. Uh, my experience, your experience, you know, and that's one of the highlights of postmodern thought, if you can call it that, is instead of a, a big umbrella over which truth is derived, under which we find our meaning, we could call modernism, postmodernism is a breaking down of those umbrellas to individual cocoons, individual umbrellas, under which I have mine and you have yours. No one's really wrong. I have my interpretation and uh, my experience, your experience, and I can block or cancel things that don't fit into this umbrella, right? And this is, and in many ways, the medium has become the message. The medium has become the message. And because of, largely, sometimes because of these, we are um, splintering into these little camps. And we don't hear each other anymore um, because of that. And I can't undo that today. But what I can do is explain postmodernism, and that's what it is. And so, especially in America, everything can be catered to my wishes. If you're logged into an app on your phone or something, right, it's always like my McDonald's or my whatever, AT&T or whatever. And, and it's, just, it's just part of our culture. It's just ingrained in us. It's becoming more and more a thing. Um, I had a, a friend who's a pastor, and he said many years ago he was going to do a funeral for someone, and uh, the person's wishes was that they wanted a Frank Sinatra song played at their funeral. And my friend said, oh, great, what Sinatra song? And he said, the, the will said, I did it my way. <laughs> you know? And my friend was like, I don't think we can do that. <laughs> How about we change it to a hymn or something like that? Um, but it's true. At the end of our lives, we will live a life in large part that said, my will be done or thy will be done. I mean, right? Did you do it my way or did you do it his way? Uh, when we look at postmodern approach to the Bible, especially, it's unintentional. I don't think people necessarily mean to do this. But when we start reading the Bible as postmodern people, and maybe you're not even a Christian, like if you're, not, if you're not even a believer, uh, you do this too. Um, and it, it's okay, but it's good to be corrected a little bit. Sometimes we read the Bible, this is what people do. You, you open it up, you start reading, and the first thought you have, I've done this many times, you start thinking, what does this mean to me? Right? It's the first thing that goes through your mind. Not a bad question. It's a great question. Terrible question to lead with. Bad. Because what happens is everything becomes subjective that's on the page. You're reading it through the, the lens of your umbrella, right? Instead of getting... See, when they wrote that stuff in their Bible, they weren't thinking of you. <laughs> now, the Holy Spirit can use it today in our lives. Don't get me wrong. The first question you ask is, what did the original author say to their audience? 
Later on the line, you can do the application part. But when you lead with what does this mean to me, what happens is we tend to make God sort of a mascot of our lives, and he becomes whatever we want him to be. We can mold and shape it to fit our cocoon and our umbrella. So this leg of the table, this experience leg of the table, is really popular because you're like, well, my experience is that you're wrong and I'm right, you know? And you're like, well, that's not really how it works. I don't think that's, that's not what we're talking about today. Now I'm going to explain what I think Wesley meant by experience. Um, I had friends many years ago who, or recently, who were uh, literature teachers, like English literature teachers in high school. Any of these people, any of these poor souls in here? Oh, God bless you if that's you. <laughs> Tough gig. Um, or in college. Uh, and every single time they said it's so hard because these kids turn in these papers and it's all their thoughts. And you have to tell them, you know, it's not very good. You have to be like, your thoughts just don't make sense. You use text speak in your paper or whatever. You use slang words or this sentence doesn't make sense with this sentence. It doesn't build on itself. You're not making an argument with your hypothesis or whatever. And all my friends there, these teachers say, it's such a hard job because all the students are mad that you're telling them that their thoughts are wrong. Like, it's my thoughts. It's my experience. Who are you to tell me that it's wrong? And this is what happens is in postmodern world we live in, instead of looking at scripture, tradition, reason, experience to make sense of Christianity or the world, instead of those four words, many people just do my experience, your experience, our experience, experience. Everything goes through the lens of experience. If the battle cry of the Enlightenment uh, with the championing of reason was, I think, therefore I am, then the battle cry of postmodern America would be, I feel, therefore I am, or I am, therefore I am. And I have good news for that, though. God cares very much about your feelings, very much. Actually, they were his idea. I don't know how that came about, but that was his idea, feelings. But we don't live by our feelings, right? If you live purely by feeling, whoo, that's an up and down journey. Now, we're supposed to, the, the book of Hebrews says the righteous live by faith. Now, feelings can be like the caboose behind the engine of faith, but don't get feelings ahead of faith. Righteous people live by faith, not by feeling, because feelings will betray you. The, you know, the, the proverb says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And there's an aspect of feeling that is unreliable all, all the time. I mean, you wouldn't go around sharing all your feelings to anyone at any time, would you? You'd be like, yes, man, in the movie with Jim Carrey. Remember that movie? You just tell people how you feel all the time, the people would think you're crazy. You can't do that. You can't live by feeling alone. You have to live by faith. So the idea of ex- experience, in my, in my understanding in the Methodist church, as I've grown up in it and been ordained and gone to seminary, typically they interpret experience as this sort of a broad common sense that you just pay attention to what's going on in the world around you, and what happens is you just sort of confirm what's going on in popular culture to interpret the Bible. Um, Wesley didn't mean that. John Wesley didn't mean that at all when he talked about experience. That mindset is actually wrong. Um, He didn't mean subjective interpretation or a broad common sense. What he meant was the experience you start with to help you interpret Scripture is you start with the experience of knowing that you're a child of God, that your sins are forgiven, that you're a son and ad- you're an adopted son and daughter of God. That experience is what should inform how we read Scripture. The theologian Billy Abraham said, without a deep encounter with the living God, wherein we become aware of the things of the Spirit, through the witness of the divine Spirit, we are in darkness and death. Wesleyans, Methodists traditionally, have believed there's an experiential dimension to human knowing. And the Bible can affirm, it does affirm the reality that you are an adopted son and daughter of God. Romans chapter 8. This is what Wesley quoted all the time when he talked about experience. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption 
when we cry Abba, a very intimate title for God, when we, when we cry Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. In a Wesleyan Methodist sense, this was the experience John Wesley repeatedly pointed to, that once you know that and grow into that reality that you're an adopted son and daughter of God, that can transform how we interpret what's true. It is out of that experience of being known in that way by God that you can have true wisdom or knowledge. So in other words, you can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. You can, it, when Paul writes about that, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. And when we, when we allow evil to get footholds in our life, it can chip away at that temple. We can invite other things into it that do not belong there but we can have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. It's not a force. It's not like Buddhism or Star Wars or something like that. The Holy Spirit is a person, just like the Father and the Son have personality. The Spirit is the exact same. And it's through that relationship of the Spirit affirming with you that you are a son and daughter of God that the Bible comes alive. Apart from that, you can go to church I mean, you know, it's a cheesy joke. Going into church doesn't make you a Christian. Like going into McDonald's doesn't make you a cheeseburger. I know that's not a good joke, but I, ha- I mean, or going into a garage doesn't make you a car or whatever. It, what, what, what does though is that you know that you're an adopted son and daughter of God, that you're no longer a slave to fear, but that you are a child of God. If that is not your mindset, the Bible is just a book. It's not a love letter. It's just a history. It's just words on a page. It's just something to cast off, something that's low in the totem pole of your life. This is the 18 inches between your head and your heart, the hardest to traverse for people. You can mentally assent that the Bible is true, that Jesus is the Son of God, but not know it in your heart. And God wants us to know it in our heart, to know that you're a son and a daughter of God. I mean, what would write, lead someone to write that hymn, Blessed Assurance? Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation. Purchased of God. Born of his spirit. Washed in his blood. Whoever, the person that wrote that hymn had a deep knowing of they are an adopted son and daughter of God. Their sins are forgiven. Do you know that? Do you hear him? Is Christ real to you? Is he real? He wants to be real to you. He wants to be real to every person. It is the grace of God, the spirit assuring within us that we are children of God, that you are enough. People don't hear that enough because you don't think you're enough sometimes, do you? You think you have to jump through some religious hoop for God to be happy with you. See, Jesus said, I've not come to condemn the world. I've not come to accuse you. I've come to set people free. I've come to set people free. I've already paid the price on the cross for you. You're enough. See, when Jesus died on the cross, sometimes we so easily forget. What did it say? He said, it is finished. He gave up his spirit and he died. And he said, it, for, he said, it is finished. So what does he mean by that? It means that from that very moment in history, over 2,000 years ago, to the day we are living right now, the work of salvation is finished. And it's simply a matter of you and I choosing to step into that reality. And Satan knows he's on borrowed time. From that day to this day, he's going around like a prowling lion, like Peter says. And he knows it's only a matter of time for it's over for him. So he's doing whatever he can to obfuscate and hide the truth away from people especially believers, because you don't think you're enough. But God says you are enough, that I have purchased you with my blood. It's done. So why in the world do you keep putting me back on the cross? Why in the world do you think my sacrifice wasn't enough? Because it's finished, Jesus said. C.S. Lewis said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. What's he getting at here? Well, this metaphor 
He's saying it is through the lens of that fundamental experience of knowing you're a son and a daughter of God, forgiven of your sin. The past is in the past. He says through that experience that you can see everything else as it truly is. It is the key to unlock the purpose to your life, to give you an answer to your origin, to your meaning to life, to your destiny of where you will end up after you die. He's saying it is through that fundamental experience. This is, my friends, this is, this is essentially the gospel. This is why it's called good news. This is why it's called good news. It's what the word gospel means. And more specifically, the Spirit has come as well to direct our wills, as Jeff said last week, to give us a sanctified reason to pull down strongholds that we build up in our thought life, in our minds, things that we hold to that are not true and that bring us down. The Holy Spirit wants to direct, redirect those things, to give us a sanctified moral compass. Jesus said the Spirit would come after he was ascended. The Spirit would come as our advocate to speak for us when we don't know what to say, to be our guide in our life, to be our power source, to fill us with his Spirit, to be our comforter, and also to help the words of God come alive in our lives. But also the Spirit would come to convict us of sin, uh, to let us know when we mess up, to convict us of, lead us toward righteousness, and even of judgment. So I remember my earliest memory of being aware of when I know what I ought to have done, but I didn't do it. I was six years old, and I was living in Lilburn, Georgia. And my friend Michael, down the street, said, hey, let's play. I was like, cool, let's play. So we're, you know, we're playing, and the lady across the street, her name was Sandra. And we didn't know Sandra's husband's name, so we called him Mr. Sandra. So Sandra and Mr. Sandra's house across the street, Michael goes, hey, let's go to Mr. Sandra's house and kick a hole in his fence. And even my, my little six-year-old heart, as I walked over there and looked at that fence, and he's getting ready to kick it, I remember my heart going, no, no, little Clark, no. Don't kick a hole in Mr. Sandra's fence. What? And my mouth said, okay, that's a good idea. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So we just started kicking away like Pele. I mean, like messy up there, just beating the heck out of the fence. Kicked a hole in it. But we didn't know they had a blind dog in the backyard that got out. I just got hit by a car. So I paid the price for that. Sorry, Mom and Dad, by the way. But thank you for, thank you for correcting me. You know... The Spirit has come to remind us of the mercy of God. His direction points to his love. And when we know what we ought to do and we don't do it, it points to a moral law. Therefore, a moral law points to a moral law giver. And when we step out of that fellowship with Christ, when we, when we grieve the Spirit, God loves us too much to leave us as we are and wants to redirect with us, and he wants to redirect us toward this truth, to bear witness with our spirit that we are children of God, that you are forgiven of your sin, that it is finished, and that you are enough to me, God says. Hebrews 12 gives a beautiful picture of this idea of how God punishes, not punishes, but he, he disciplines those he loves. He says, my child, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, or lose heart when you are punished by him. For the Lord disciplines those whom he loves and chastises every child whom he accepts. Endure trials for the sake of discipline. God is treating you as children. For what child is there whom a parent does not discipline? And I think one thing that God wants to pull us away from to discipline us about is, again, Romans 8.15. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Somebody doesn't think they're enough. When I worked with teenagers for so long, and some of them were adopted, and they would come to me and they'd talk to me, and they would struggle with that. I mean, they were thankful that they were adopted, they had a family, but they would struggle with, where am I from? Like, who are my real parents? Like, I, I don't know where I belong. And we would talk about that. You know, it, it's really like a fear of abandonment. It's like that scene from Goodwill Hunting 
when Robin Williams is the counselor and Matt Damon is like the, the, the foster kid who's also like a super genius. It's not fair. Super genius. And Robin Williams looks to him again and again and says, it's not your fault. You know, Matt Damon was abused by his foster parents. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And, and finally they embrace. And it's like, sorry to spoiler alert, by the way. <laughs> My bad. But it's just that, that reminder of you have to drill down deep to get over that, that hump of, of feeling like you're not enough, that, that when God says, I've adopted you, I think a lot of people, what they're asking is, can I trust God? I mentally believe in the Bible, but can I trust it? And Romans 8 is saying, you've been adopted as my son and daughter. You can trust me. You can trust me. Can I, you, I don't want you to fall back into a place of fear but I want you to come into this place of adoption that I've received you as my own. So how, how, how do you know that? How do you know this for yourself? Let's just, with the brass tacks here, how do you know it? For one, God's promises have already said it. Jesus said it's finished. So that is, so you're thinking, do I have to accept this by faith? Yes, you do. You accept it by faith. All good things in life are accepted by faith. We accept all sorts of things by faith every single day. Love is done by faith, Right? I mean, you can really think about it. We're, all, we're always living by faith. But the most important thing we live by faith is believe it first. Believe it and receive it for, for yourself first. Don't seek to understand it. Don't try and, if you're like me, you want to break it all down. No. Believe and receive it first. Understanding comes later. You'll spend the rest of your life trying to understand it. And it's a glorious thing. It's the most glorious thing. Believe it first. Then you'll understand it as you, as you walk with God into it. I'm going to say a prayer for us, and we're going to sing a great song called um, No Longer Slaves. And I invite you to come and pray, and I'll be sitting up here if you want someone to pray with. Uh, let's pray together. Thank you, God, that you are telling us today that we're enough and that you have adopted us as your own, that you love us as we are. You don't want to leave us as we are, but you come to transform us day by day. And Holy Spirit, continue to do this work within us. I I really feel you have said something to somebody today that they needed to hear. That they were caught up in that slavery to fear. I'm caught in the past. I'm not enough. The promises are too good. They're They're for somebody else. Lord, bring down these strongholds and replace them with the truths of what you say that will never pass away. Your words will never pass away. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.